It's good to be the king, a famous movie once said. But how do you get to do it? In slavery, it's really kind of interesting. One part of the population becomes the property of the other. Literally, people are like animals or objects. They're the property. And you make them do all the work. And it's really good because as fast as they produce it, you get it. You other people. Let's call you, for lack of a better term, masters. You're the masters. You get it. The slaves produce it. You get. But you're, you're not stupid. Well, not all of them are stupid. You realize that this is, this is great. I'm getting it. They're doing it, and I'm getting it. But I would like this to continue. But in order for it to continue, the slaves can't be dead tomorrow. So I'm going to have to, here we go, take part of what the slaves produced and give to me, the master, and I'm going to give it back to them. To feed them, to clothe them, to shelter them, so they are in a position to come back tomorrow and do this again. So in slavery, the slave produces the surplus that the master keeps. And then the master uses it in all the ways the master would like for his standard of living and maybe to have a whole bunch of guys with sticks just to make sure that the slaves don't wake up one morning and decide, hey, we are the majority and there's not so many of them. We can fix this. Oh, but there's the guys with the sticks. So you get a system, which is really interesting now, Think what it does to your brain, where the slaves are producing the means of their own enslavement. They're delivering the sticks, which also teaches the slave who's willing to think. This is a system which can only exist so long as we permit it. Because if we don't produce and deliver that surplus, they got no sticks. And the people with the sticks have got nothing to eat. And they're not going to be bothering us with their sticks if they're dying of starvation, which is maybe how we fix this problem. In feudalism, same game. Only we call the players different names because they're not property. We have the serfs and the lords. Those of you who never heard about feudalism or European, three days a week the serf works with his or her family on their plot of land. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, they leave that plot, they go to the land of the Lord. And they work there, but the fruits of their labor on the land of the Lord goes to the Lord. And on Sunday, very important, on Sunday, they go to a special place where a person tells them that this is what God wants them to do. And even if it doesn't feel good, as soon as they're dead, it'll be better. Don't laugh, folks. Don't laugh. Now Marx's punchline. Capitalism. Capitalism, he teaches us, came into the world at the time of the French Revolution, at the time of the American Revolution, you know, the end of the 18th century, 19th, so forth, or a little bit earlier in England. Capitalism comes in and says, we are the end of all of that. No more slavery. No more feudalism. We're getting rid of the masters. We're getting rid of the lords. We're guillotining. We're separating the Louis the head from the rest of him, and he's quiet after that. We're going to make a revolution, and this capital, this new system we're bringing in, is going to give us liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy. In America, they emphasize democracy. In France, liberty, equality, fraternity. The three slogans of the French Revolution. And they make a revolution, and they destroy feudalism, and they destroy what's left of slavery, or if not then, a little bit later, and we have capitalism, which is now global. And Marx reaches his maturity 50 years after the French Revolution, a little bit longer. And he looks around, and here comes his great epiphany moment. He looks around, and he says, we got capitalism. We've defeated slavery. We've defeated feudalism. And Good riddance to them. But capitalism promised liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy. And as I look around the 1840s and the 1850s around me, I see capitalism, but I don't see those other things. I don't see any liberty, equality, fraternity, or democracy. Capitalism, here comes the punchline, is a revolution 
betrayed. It is a revolution that promised what it never delivered and hasn't to this day. And Marx is, says to himself, I am go I, Marx, I'm going to explain in my writings and my thinking why capitalism couldn't deliver on what it promised to the mass of people who helped the capitalist overthrow slavery and feudalism. And his answer was, capitalism isn't the break with slavery and feudalism it claimed it was. It's the same damn thing in a slightly altered form. Instead of slave and master, instead of serf and lord, you have employee and employer. And the employees produce a surplus that they deliver to the employer who uses it to have people in dark blue uniforms with sticks in case you get out of line. You see them all over New York and you worry about them for the same reason everybody always did. When you go to work, simplest way I know how to get this across, you sit with your employer, you discuss the conditions of your job, and you come to the point, how much am I going to get paid? And let's say it's 20 bucks an hour, you settle with your employer, you'll get paid. You're going to come in 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, you're going to work, you're going to get your $20 an hour. You will know what Marx teaches without ever having read it but Marx will make you understand it a lot better. You know that that employer would never pay you $20 an hour if the following work weren't true. That during that hour, your brains, your muscles, your labor will produce more extra stuff for that man to sell at the end of the week than $20 worth. His factory, his raw materials... Those are in... He buys those, and the output has that in it. But what's... We call that value added in economics. When you buy a machine and you buy raw materials that have a certain value in them, say 100. The labor of a human being adds another value to it. That's the value added. That value added is all we're talking about. That value added has to be more than it costs the employer to get you there to add the value by your labor. You have to produce a surplus or else you don't have a job. Those of you who have told yourself, I'll never work for anybody who doesn't pay me what I'm worth, you don't understand capitalism. That's never going to happen. <laughs> capitalism is, to use a technical term, the fuck you system of economics. <laughs> and it counts on you not wanting to hear the bad words. It counts on you. You don't want to face it. You don't want to understand what it means to be, as Marx loved to say, a wage slave, sticking it to you by connecting the modern term of you, what you get to the old slave, which is the reality. Of course you're a slave. Your choice is which employer you're going to produce surplus for. You have no liberty, you have freedom from this situation. Capitalism has trapped you in it. And therefore, what's the solution? Marx's logic. We have to finally break from the dichotomy, from this splitting of the production into the two groups, those who produce the surplus and those who get it and decide what to do with it. We've got to stop that. Not just the slave and master, not just the serf and the lord, but the employer and the employee. The reason democracy at work advocates for worker co-ops is because that's what they are. They're the end of that split. It's the end of the absurd notion you have to be an employer or an employee. There's no other way to organize it. That's what people in slavery thought. There's no other way than slavery. There's no other way. How could you have a business where there isn't a boss? Oh, stop. How can you have a society without a king? We managed. We can manage this one too.